All right, good to see you here. Um, as uh, I was introduced, my name is Milan Yankov. I work for a company called LifeRay, uh, and I'm quite curious if you ever heard of LifeRay, anyone? All right, a couple of people. Um, so uh, I work as a developer advocate, which means most of the time what I do is I go to conferences and um, meet people and try to figure out how the things that we do at LifeRay actually um, are used by people, what helps them, uh, what we can do better, and, and things like that. And um, you may be familiar uh, with LifeRay, the portal, those of you who raised your hands, because this is historically where we come from. But today, uh, LifeRay develops like a bunch of other products. Um, and the challenges that we face will, when we build all those products is we build functionalities that we end up using in different places or we have like one product uses another product. Um, and so we need to build them in a way that, uh, that, that allows us to easily use, reuse functionalities between products. Um, and if you think about it, um, that's, that's how like one of the things that probably Maven solves in the Java world is uh, you build libraries and then you reuse libraries, but that doesn't work quite well for us. And so what I'm gonna be showing you today is a concept. It's not something that is like a product that you can download and use and, you know, um, and uh, something that uh, we, we as a life rate develop, but rather my approach to summarize the experience that we have with all those products uh, uh, to actually manage uh, the way we handle things uh, uh, like common codes and dependencies between, uh, between products. So a little bit of history. Uh, probably you remember the time when we all used this new keyword and every time we wanted to create an object, right? And uh, anyone still uses that? Uh, I get a few people, because I think most of you, if you followed the exact same path that I follow for the last 10 years, or like 15 already, or maybe even more, um, is that we moved to what we know as dependency injection. Spring showed up and told us, hey, you can do things differently. You don't have to do new anymore. You can define your stuff in this XML file, and then we wire it for you. Okay, and now we moved even a step forward. You don't use XML anymore, but instead you use annotations, right? So you just use a component and then you wire up things. So, why we did that? Now, it wasn't about making things any easier or simpler, if you think about it. If, in fact, in the, in the early days of Spring, you had to write more code to actually wire a class with another class. Because normally you would just say new and instantiate a class. But then you had to write all this Spring XML huge thing and then let some third party framework wire things for you. So why? Why everyone jumped on doing it? Well, because it wasn't about simpler and faster. It was about introducing a new way of managing dependencies between components and opened the door for a lot more than that. So you could do things like um, interceptors, uh, you could automatically add transaction managers and stuff like that. It wasn't about easier, it was just about more powerful. Okay, do you remember these days when you had lips and depths folders? in your project, and this is where all the jar files were, uh, and then you had to uh, like know what to put in those folders, all right? Anyone remembers? A oh, few people, well, I thought, I, I, now I feel better that I'm not the oldest in the room. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then Maven showed up <coughs> one day, I say, hey, wait a minute, we can manage this much more easier, right? We're just gonna define our dependencies in this POM file, and then we're gonna go grab them from the central repository and wire them for you. Great, except it wasn't a new concept. It was the exact same thing that we had with dips and leps, uh, uh, with lips and depths and whatever we need to call that folder. It's just that we now put the stuff in an XML file and it knows where to download it from. It's the exact same thing, except we, we change the way we distribute and download and store dependencies. That's the only difference. 
So it, it didn't fundamentally change the way we think about dependencies. And so we end up with things like this. Every time, and that's a simple one, by the way. Uh, uh, so if you open a fair size in uh, a Java project, Maven based, and you go and say dependencies, column three, and you see this like probably won't fit on your screen, right? And this is like a normal thing in today's Java world. Everyone is okay with that. Well, not everyone, I'm not okay with that, but a lot of people are okay with that, okay? So let's think about what is the issue. So you know that Maven handles transitive dependencies, but it's still you, the developer, that needs to handle the conflicts. So if you have dependency that has two jar files in different versions, it's at the end of the day you that needs to open one of the POM files and say exclude, and exclude something that doesn't fit, otherwise your system's not gonna build, right? How many of you are aware of the fact that Maven has version ranges? Like, okay, not even half of the room. So that's, that's something I find surprising every time I ask about it. Like, not a lot of people are even aware of the fact that you can actually define a range uh, in Maven to say, I want it between this and this version. But even though, even though you can say, uh, though my dependencies in this version range, at the end of the day, you still need one and only one that goes inside the final uh, application assembly, and it's again you, the developer, that needs to know which one, according to taking into account everything else that needs to go in, uh, which one you need to choose. And uh, SLF4J is a perfect example for this. I, I don't know how many of you have had this problem, but there's common uh, issues with, with SLF4J because uh, a lot of libraries are using it. And uh, solving that, sometimes it's really challenges, challenging. So another thing that you have in Maven is scopes, right? So you can have the compile scopes, uh, the, the uh, runtime provided, and so forth. But how do you know what's provided? Let's say you want to run your application on a Tomcat. How do you know what's, on, what's already installed on that, on that Tomcat? Right? If it's a clean Tomcat or clean JBoss or something, well, you probably know. But if, if it is a running system that already has something there, how do you know what's there? How do you manage those things? Again, it's you that needs to keep track of what's going on on that running system someplace and then build against the exact same things that hopefully are in production when you happen to go and do the deployment. Right? So it's another thing that the system doesn't help you do. Um, another thing that is maybe not that common, but, but happens a lot is, what if you have a dependency on, on an operating system, for example? What if some of your jar files only run on a particular operating system or on a particular infrastructure or things like that? You cannot express those things in Maven. You cannot tell, uh, by the way, if I'm building for OS uh, X, use this, and for Windows, use that. I mean, you can use profiles, but it's, again, manual job. You need to know these jar files only run on this particular operating system or this particular infrastructure. It all goes down to one thing, which is the main problem of everything you think of about dependency management today. There is no information about why things depend on each other. All you need to know, all you, you're given, is the fact that A depends on B, and you have no clue why. And that's, that's not enough. That's not enough if you want to do automatic dependency management, if you want to build stuff in a way that needs to work more seamlessly with each other. So this is how we think about dependencies today. We have boxes. And we define dependencies between the boxes. So we say the box A depends on box B. And we feel good about it. The reality, though, is different. In reality, it's something inside the box A that needs something inside the box B. It's in, 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 in the most obvious case, it's a class in, in box A, in, in a jar A, that needs another class in another jar. 
So the, the, the actual dependencies between a class and a class, or a, a package and a package, not really between a box and a box, but we just make things simple by saying this box needs this other box. So what if we can actually express the dependencies the way they are instead of wrapping them in boxes and then just, trans just, in, just saying that box depends on a box? So let's imagine that we have something that can look inside that box and figure out somehow that, well, this item actually needs something, some other item, and can put this as a metadata in the box. So we don't only have the name of the box, but we also have a metadata that says, well, in this box, we have these things, and they require these things in order to function properly. And on the flip side of that, I can inspect another box and say, well, wait a minute, this box provides some things, okay? So it's not just that we have a box and a name and a version of that box, but we also have a metadata about what's actually inside that box. And so once you have those, if you have those, you can do things like contracts. You don't have to have dependencies anymore, but you can say, oh, wait a minute, I know this box requires those things, and I know this other box provides those things, so if I put these two boxes together, they should figure it out somehow and work together to solve a particular problem. And so this is the concept that I'm trying to introduce this today uh, to you, is to not having a hard-coded dependencies, but rather using contracts to discover what we need uh, at runtime. This is very hard to explain uh, in theory, so I have a little demo for you. Um, let's see. Okay, can you read the text? All right, good. So what I have here, uh, oops, wrong. Forgot to open this earlier. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, hopefully. Okay. So. Why do I have so many projects here? It's not supposed to be this way. Oh. Okay, and something's wrong with my demo, but I'll try to show it to you anyway. Some, some things you need to ignore for now. Uh, wait a second, one more thing I need to check. Still have too many projects here. Okay, never mind. Uh, we'll go for it. Okay, so what I have here is I have um, uh, a simple API, uh, which I'm going to show you. Not test main Java. Um, where is the class? Okay, which is a simple interface. Hope you can read it now. 
uh, it provides a method. It can calculate something from a string expression. It's a very, very, very simple thing. Okay. What I also have is this um, thing here, which is an implementation of that. Uh, sorry, this one, this one. It's called Simple Calculator, Implements Calculator. It's a very dumb implementation. Don't bother about how it works. It just can do basic stuff like adding and subtracting things. Okay? The main thing is it's an implementation of that, the, that interface. So what I also have in here is this project called Markup, um, which is an attempt to build a markup language. Uh, wait a minute. Where it is? Here it is. So the markup is it reads stuff between the math and math tags and evaluates that as a mathematical expression and prints out the result. Very simple thing. So if you look in the POM file, uh, the math, uh, the, um, mm, the uh, uh, markup only depends on the API, because that's the only thing it needs, right? It needs an API because it needs to compile against the API. And that's pretty much it. Now let's look at the other POMs. So uh, here we go. The this is basically, uh, hmm, wait, this is where it is. Go KPI, pump. Okay, it doesn't even, uh, this is messes up my projects for some reason. I have no idea why. Uh, it shouldn't be this way. Okay. Uh, ah, wait a second. Never mind. Um, so, and finally, what I have is ignore the poems for now. Uh, is this editor in here, uh, which you can see it only depends on the markup, um, and uh, it's a simple Java Swing application that uses. The like it has a text box that you can type a mark a markup and it express uh, it, it evaluates the the markup and prints it out. So I also use a Maven Shade plugin. How many of you know the Shade plugin? Okay, a few. So Shade plugin allows you to assemble the whole thing and eventually build a single executable thing. So it uses this thing transformer to basically add something to the manifest file uh, and calculate a single executable. Um, so that's pretty much how it works. So Okay. So it builds this four projects, the uh API, uh, the simple implementation of the API, the markup and the editor. Uh actually I'm going to show you how this looks like it's so you you understand the uh, the idea is you have a cog, uh, api you have some implementation of it um you have the markup that uses the api and then editor it uses the markup and then you build a single executable so this is what i'm going to do now i'm going to go java jar editor target editor jar and this is going to open, hopefully, a swing application for me, which is fairly simple. How to zoom in here. Um, so you have um, an expression, and you click the preview button, and it shows you the result. And the result is exception. Anyone has any idea why? OK. It's because of this, because the editor has no idea about the implementation. Well, how is that possible? Well, it is possible because we used a very fancy Java feature, which is called service loader. How many of you are familiar with service loader in Java? 
it's another surprise for me. It's like every conference I ask this question, it's like very few people, and Service Loader has been around since Java 6. By the way, it's one of the crucial features in Java 9. So you probably need to get familiar with it as soon as possible. So how that works, let me show you. So when you provide a, an implementation of something, which is our simple calculator here, you also, in a meta-inf, create a file with the name, the name of the file, is the name of the service, and inside you put the name of the implementation. And this is like the Java standard way of creating um, uh, services. And then when you use that in markup, for example, um, uh, you use this service loader thing that basically loads the class from this uh, service loader infrastructure that Java provides for you. So it loads dynamically a service from the class path for you. The problem is, in, in here, simple calculator, it's not on a class path. It's not on a class path because we never said that anything depends on it in, in Maven. And in fact, nothing depends on it at compile time. But, it do, but, but few things need it at runtime. So how do we solve that? Well, obvious way is to say that it, either editor or markup, depends on what's our preference, depends on the actual implementation. How many of you would do that? Yeah, and yeah, the rest is just not admitting it. Uh, that's how we solve problems, right? We miss the dependency, okay, so we put depend somewhere, it's now in the class part, and it runs, and it's fine. But the reality is we just messed up our dependency graph. We introduced a dependency on something that we don't actually depend on unless uh, 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 before we go runtime, right? So what's the better way to solve that problem? The better way is to introduce contracts, to basically say, well, markup is not functioning on its own. It needs an implementation of that simple calculator, of that, of that calculator API, and uh, it doesn't really care what the implementation is as long as there is an implementation, right? So um, this is uh, how we're going to change things now. We're going to say someplace that the markup actually requires an implementation of a calculator. And we also change our, our simple calculator to say someplace that it provides an implementation of that calculator, okay? If we add more calculators later on, which we will, uh, we can also provide information about those that they are also implementing calculator API. So we're going to put all these calculator implementations into something that we're going to call index. And this is just going to be a list of all the, the jar files that, depend, that implement this particular API. And then we're going to tell our editor to resolve itself without us interacting with it, to you go use that index and figure out what you need on, at runtime in order to properly run that application. Let's see how, how we can do that. Hopefully my demo is not screwed up uh, as much as I think it is. Uh, so, okay, and now to show you the differences. Okay, so here is what changed. Let's first thing first. The Calc API. In, you know, the first thing we changed the palm, and inside the palm, we introduced this thing that I created that's called um, eccentric modularity. It's a Maven extension, and it's the only reason for this to exist is to demonstrate this, this concept, right? So it's a proof of concept, it's not a project, it's not something production ready, it's just so that it simplifies the way we think, we think about dependencies. So you will see that is added to every single project. It's a Maven extension that allows us to do things like this. Use tags like this in properties. 
which says, well, this is an eccentric modularity metadata. Please do this for me. So what this is going to do is it's going to enhance your jar file, putting some more metadata about actually what is inside your jar file into the manifest MF file. That's the only thing you do here. OK, so the same thing is going to happen to the, um, to the markup and pretty much anything. The POM, you will see we have everywhere the extension added. Um, now, another change is the simple calculator. Inside the simple calculator, we use an annotation in here that says provides capability. What we say here is that we provide a capability that's called calculator, and in order to distinguish from any different calculators that someone may choose to use any time in the future, we also use a namespace. So I'm here using eccentric modularity demo as my namespace. So that's a, the, the, the capability that I provide as a calculator in this namespace. Okay, and that's pretty much it. And if you look inside the palm uh, for the simple calculator, it does the exact same thing. It, pr it just enhances my jar file with some metadata. That's pretty much it. Now, on the flip side, the markup, I again use a notation, it's just this time called require capability. And I'm saying that, well, in order for this markup to function, it requires a calculator. It requires a calculator that is in this namespace, and it's called calculator. So I don't really care where this comes from. I don't really care how this is implemented. All I need is something that fulfills that contract. Okay. So, uh, anything else important here? Uh, yep, a new project, IndexCalc. And this IndexCalc is a simple project that only has a POM. And in this POM, again, I have the extension, and the only thing different uh, in here is that my packaging is, called, is index. So this is not gonna build a jar file. It's gonna build an XML, Exhibit XML file, which is going to contain the index of every, uh, of every single dependency. And the only dependency that we right now have here is our implementation. So we can build different indexes containing different other um, uh, different dependencies, but it's, again, it's just building it uh, to, uh, so that we can resolve against that index. <coughs> Sorry. So back to the slide. So this is. This is, how do I point out? This is this guy here, okay? So it's just a list of stuff that we're gonna use to resolve against, okay? Let's rebuild the whole thing now again and see if it works. Even clean install. Okay, so you see now we have the index also built. And actually, if you look inside the index, you will see inside the target folder, that's what you have. Oh, actually, uh, I can show you that uh, better here, uh, where it is, index, index, index. Uh, oh, here it is, index cog, target, index XML. This is how it looks like. Uh, it just built an, in, uh, an XML file that says, uh, what is the bundle, what is the, uh, where it comes from, what it can do, and things like that. Okay? And, uh, okay, so now I can run the, the, the same thing again. And, where is it, zoom. And now if I click on preview, it can already calculate stuff, right? And the reason it can do this is because the resolver now knew that this markup actually needs an implementation of the calculator, and because we knew where to find it, it finds it and runs it and adds it at runtime. Um, it also uses a, again, it uses Maven Shade plugin to actually, once it resolves the, the, those jar files, which you can see them uh, in here. So now in the uh, editor, in the target export editor, you see 
those are the jar files it resolved that are needed at runtime to actually run this thing. Okay, so I'm gonna go just one more step further uh, to show you a little bit more compli uh, complicated example. So I'm gonna get step three and then I'm gonna change, make the difference with step two um, and show you what we do here. So in here, we wanna build a RESTful uh, service that we can run standalone, much like Spring Boot, and uh, this is gonna do mathematical operations. You put an expression as a parameter and it gives you the result. So this is my RESTful service. It's called Calc REST service, and in here I'm using something uh, called declarative services to wire wrap things. Uh, you, can, you can think of it as a, a, a fancy version of Spring. Um, I'm not gonna go in details about um, declarative services, but basically what you need to do is you need to declare your stuff as a component, and then you could use add reference to wire wrap things, um, and other than that, it's a standard JAX-RS. It's slash calc, this is where we wanna run this, uh, and we also have the path, which is the expression, and then we use the calculator, which we wire here to actually calculate the expression. So very simple RESTful, RESTful service. Well, you've seen these two other annotations, and you may wonder what they are those about. So those are custom annotations, which I created in here to simplify the require capability kind of thing. Uh, so basically, this uh, require JAXRS whiteboard is an annotation that says, well, I require a JAXRS contract and which has the property of whiteboard equals true. And also, we have another one which says require power calculator, and this says it requires a, um, a calculator from the uh, eccentric modularity demo uh, which has the property power equals true. Uh, okay, wait a minute, what, that, what does that mean? Well, we actually created a new calculator in here, a new implementation, it's called fancy calculator. And if you look into the fancy calculator, it's a little bit different, it uses a uh, true library called Parsi, and Parsi is basically able to do a whole kind of mathematical operations. Um, so we use Parsi to do full math, and um, now, when we actually say that we provide a capability, uh, it is the same capability, it's a calculator at the same namespace, so we now have more than one thing that fulfills the exact same requirements, but in here we also provide these properties. So we can say it can add, it can subtract, it can multiply things, and so forth. Oh, and we do have power equals true, so this is what the resolver is gonna use to match our requirement against our capability. So anything that says it can do uh, power uh, m operation in math, it, it's gonna work. Okay, but in order to run this, um, we now need to have a, uh, uh, the bo both, thick and both implementations in our index. So this is what we do here. We have a calc simple and calc fancy. Uh, so the index is gonna contain the two. The resolver is gonna pick the right one for us. We don't have to do it ourselves. Um, we also create another index, which is, contains a bunch of jar files that are needed in order to, to run a standalone RESTful service. Um, so again, the resolver is gonna pick from all these hundreds of jar files in that index what is it that we actually need. Uh, and finally, we have this thing, this in here, this augment project, uh, and this thing is needed because we can manage metadata for the jar files that we create ourselves, that's easy. But what if we wanna use jar files that someone else provided earlier and they didn't put any metadata in that jar files. So we don't know what is exactly in that files. So we need to augment those files, those jar files with metadata so we can use them. And this is exactly what this project does. It basically says, well, this JavaX JAXRS API is not meant to be used in runtime. So we're just gonna say it requires compile only. This is basically a requirement that's never gonna be satisfied. So this 
a jar file is never going to be selected at runtime. On the other hand, we have this thing at Eclipse Source JaxRS Publisher that we know it can run JaxRS services using the whiteboard pattern, which I'm not going to go in details again. And, but they didn't provide the metadata in it, so we're just going to provide it for them. So we're going to just say it, is, it uses uh, Java, Jack, Java JaxRS contract, and it can do whiteboard. Okay, that's pretty much it. It's just augmenting existing jar files that didn't have this information uh, in it. Um, and so this is pretty much it. Uh, I'm gonna skip the palm for, uh, okay. Actually, no, I'm gonna show you. The palm for the rest is now uh, the same thing. It, it uses the extension. And now, instead of just adding the property, we're going to actually use profiles in here. So we're going to use the default profile. And the default profile is going to use um, elect, uh, eccentric modularity executable. So basically, we say we want to build an executable jar file out of this thing. Well, we do have another profile, though, which is called LifeRay. And in this here, we say elastic, uh, I'm sorry, eccentric modularity target runtime. And we provide. A, uh, a, an address of an existing runtime where we want to deploy the thing. I'll show you how that works in a, little, in a, in a second. First, let's do the, um, the obvious thing. Uh, I need to close this. So let's build it. Uh, Maven clean install. And you'll see now a bunch of other projects added uh, and compiled. Okay, and uh, here is our REST service. And if you go to the REST service now, Java jar REST target REST jar, you can run this. And that's a standalone executable jar file. And now you can go to, uh, why is this? How to make this bigger? Okay, try this one. Uh, you can go here, and you see that this actually works. It's a uh, calculator service, so we can do two to the power of eight. Great. Okay, so this is a standalone jar file that we just built, and if you look what is inside, um, here it is, rest, uh, target, rest jar, it's in here. You will see, I uh, can't zoom this one. You will see that it basically, Compose, it's composed of a bunch of a jar files that we resolved. So, um, can't I just zoom this somehow? Okay, in, in this way. So, you will see in here, it is a, uh, something like Calc API, Calc Fancy. It's, well, even though we, fi we have two implementation of the Calc service, because we specified that we need a service that uh, uh, satisfies a particular requirement, it knew which one to, figure, to pick. So we have Jersey, we have uh, Jetty, Servlet API, uh, and a bunch of other jar files that we need for the runtime, um, and we just build a single executable. Uh, what if we want to deploy that on, on, on a running life ray, uh, for example? You mean you can try that with different other Runtimes, I, I haven't, uh, uh, eccentric modularity for now uh, supports anything that has a um, uh, so-called uh, uh, agent that can tell you what is running inside that environment. So if you have agents for different environments, um, it, can, it can try it against any uh, other environment. Um, so I'm just going to stop this and build it with a profile life ray. Um, so it's going to do the exact same thing now, but it's going to pass a different command to the eccentric modularity extension. And what you may see here is, 
somewhere over here. It says, okay, it says building a distro jar, metadata only, from provided target runtime. Okay, so this is what it actually does before uh, starting to build the actual extension. It's gonna go get the runtime, it's gonna figure out what's inside the runtime, and, uh, and then it's gonna uh, build against what it knows that it's in your runtime, okay? And now if you look into, into the REST target again, you will see that we don't have the REST uh, jar here anymore because we don't wanna build a single executable, but it, again, in the export folder, we have a bunch of jar files that we need to deploy at this runtime for this thing to work. So let's just do that. And I started, I need to find my life ray, which is gonna be here. Uh, life ray G3 modules. And in here, it's gonna be uh, in projects. Demo, rest, target, uh, not index, export, rest. So I'm just gonna grab this jar files and copy them there, okay? And just, I need to give it a second to deploy. Okay, it's already there. So if I now go to local host 8080, which is my life ray, uh, I can try to do the same thing, services calc. It's not gonna work, and the reason it's, uh, is because all the URLs in life ray are automatically handled by the platform. If you wanna have direct access to the services, we've provided a dedicated slash O which basically uh, allows you to bypass the platform and go straight to the services. So, slash O, uh, probably called REST. Yeah, uh, I changed the name. So, in here it's called REST. So, I can do things like, I don't know, four to the power of five, uh, all right? And uh, and things like that. Um, uh, how to zoom that? Uh, okay, four, three plus five to the power of two, things like that. Okay, so now I have the exact same thing, just deployed in a different runtime. Okay, or I can use the exact same thing to build a, run to, uh, a, a single, a standalone um, uh, executable. Um, so, this is where we were, um, and this is the big picture, uh, which this concept is, is showing you. So all these libraries comes from some place. Ideally, you can, you can use that for that Maven Central, you can use something else, uh, uh, doesn't really matter. As long as you have a URL that points you to the library, you're good to go. Uh, and then you build this repositories, which contains some of the libraries which are used to for the resolver to figure out what needs to be at runtime. And the question that often comes at this point is, oh, wait a minute, why do I need the repository? Can't I just build one repository, feed it up with the whole Maven Central, and then it's gonna just resolve against Maven Central? No. And the reason for that is the resolve operation against Maven Central is NP complete. It's uh, it, the, the, the complexity of that operation. If you try to resolve again Maven Central, it's never gonna resolve. It's, it's not gonna resolve in a lifetime, okay? So you need to have a repository that is a subset uh, that actually will allow you, the resolver, to finish up resolving stuff in, 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 in meaningful time. So th that's why you need the repositories. You need, and, and also repositories gives you the, the um, a certainty that you know what exactly you're building, you're picking from, 
Okay, so those become part of your, uh, of, of, of your project. Uh, much like dependencies, the only difference is, um, like so if I were to build the exact same thing with Spring Boot, uh, and I was gonna say, uh, you know, just this 35 jar files, what Spring Boot's gonna do is gonna throw 35 jar files inside my single executable just in case you need them, right? Because that's how they work. Whereas the resolver is going to only scan what you need based on requirements and capabilities and only put all those things that you need inside your jar file. So the, the other side, and this goes to the so-called resolve context um, that, that, that the resolver uses. Uh, also, you can hook up this, like, like I showed you, with a running inst instance. So you can have an agent in a running instance and say, give me everything that's already available for me. Okay, so now mix and match. Those are the things that I generally need uh, to run. Those are the things that are provided at the runtime. And tell me, out of all those things that you know that they are there, what exactly should I deploy at my runtime in order for this to run? And then the resolver is doing exactly that, giving you a set of libraries that you need at your runtime, um, and uh, depends on how you say, uh, how you say you want to deploy them. Um, again, the eccentric modularity is just a proof of concept, just making things easier. It does not, you don't need it to, employ, to, to use the concept in general. We use this concept at LifeRay without using the eccentric modularity. That's just for the purpose of making it easier to comprehend. That's it from me. I hope it was interesting. I hope it was um, um, opening your eyes to some new ideas about managing dependencies. I go by Milan Yangov on Twitter, so feel free to tweet and, uh, and tell me what you think uh, you agree or you don't agree. And um, uh, the code is on GitHub. You can search for eccentric modularity if you want to play with it. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Uh, questions? Oh, OK. You want to go with the mic, or, or I'll repeat it. No worry. In the index. Uh, so, the, so n now you, you're gonna get an, so if you, if the resolver cannot resolve it, you, you're gonna get an exception compiled on, at build time. Yeah. So the, at build time, the resolver will tell you, well, you've specified this, uh, but I cannot find this for you, so I cannot assemble your runtime. Um, so if you, if you, if your mistake is that you didn't provide the requirement. Well, the resolver does not know that you require something, so then you had the same situation. You're only going to discover this at runtime. But if you said, I require this, and you didn't put it in the index, for example, or you didn't uh, add the index to the resolving process, the resolver will try to build a, a runtime for you and tell you, sorry, I can't do this for you because you said you need this, and this is nowhere to find. Any more questions? So that actually depends on how big your dependencies are. So yes, yeah, so this, this uses about, I don't know, I mean, the index, if I run uh, the whole thing, it's probably about 100 artifacts, 100 or, or so. Uh, and you saw it, it runs like normal maven. Uh, I think if you go with like, I don't know, tens of thousands of artifacts, you will probably see, uh, see it slowing down. Um, if you go against Maven Central, mm, that's probably never going never to finish. Um, so it, it, it really depends. And it also depends on uh, like how many passes it needs to go, because you may have, like, this, those are fairly simple examples. 
and it's like, oh, I need this, I have this, and that's it. But you can really go crazy with that. You can say, I want this, but not this. If not this, then some, you know. And then the logic, the resolving logic, becomes really complicated. It needs to go do several passes over all the dependencies. And sometimes it's going to figure out some dependencies, and at the end, it's going to be a requirement. It's going to say, oh, no, no, not this one. So it needs to go another pass. So it may, for very complex cases, it may become really, uh, really slow. Uh, but we, we use this, I mean, again, not the eccentric modularity itself, but the same concept at LifeRay for a project that uh, has, I don't know, I, I think right now close to a thousand modules. Uh, and um, as long as we keep the, the, the requirements and capabilities nice and clean, um, we never had any issues with that. So. So first thing is decoupling, decoupling artifacts. So you don't have to depend on, on implementations. So we don't, we don't want to depend on implementations. Second thing, library is a platform. And when, if we were building a project that we were the only users of, uh, that wouldn't be such a, a great benefit, right? I mean, we can depend on, on implementations. We know our own implementations, and that's fine. But we're building a platform which we are giving to people to build stuff with it. So basically, we don't know how people will use that platform. So we need things to be nice and clean and decoupled from each other. So basically, you saw the REST uh, example. This is what LifeRay does. Is basically, uh, there, there is a REST requirements about uh, REST provider and REST service, right? And so as soon as when you want to develop a, a RESTful service for LifeRay, you basically say, this is my JAX REST, and I deploy it. Oh, and I need something that runs it. Right? So we don't want to be in a position to tell you, oh, you know, you need to use Jersey or you need to use this particular implementation because we said so. Right? We basically say, okay, we, we give you the infrastructure level, you deploy your RESTful services, and you deploy your RESTful providers. You can even have more than one provider for the RESTful services if you want to. D just because we want to give you the flexibility to actually do whatever you need to do and not what we tell you to do. Right, so from that perspective, that's very valuable for us. All right, thank you guys. Um, I'm going to be around, so if you have more questions, feel free to find me and talk to me anytime or um, you know, just uh, tweet and I'll try to answer as much as I can. Thank you.